thank you all for coming. Um, I would apologize for the Canberra winter, but it seems that we've all of a sudden found the Canberra spring today. Uh, but thank you for coming, many of the familiar faces. Um, familiar in the sense that we just had another speaker on similar topics a few weeks back. Um, and so we're very proud at the ANU College of Asia and Pacific to be hosting these talks on Sri Lanka, um, an important part of our region and our world. My name is Kent Anderson, and I'm the Deputy Director of the College of Asia and Pacific. And it's my pleasure tonight to be able to welcome and introduce Gordon Weiss. Gordon will be known to many of you, and indeed the subject of the talk is about his new book, The Cage, The Fight for Sri Lanka and the Last Days of the Tamil Tigers. Um, but Gordon comes with a fascinating background and one that really prepared him to write this book. He originally was a freelance journalist working a bit all over the world, um, but the bulk of his career was working in international public sector um, and working in crisis and conflict areas. So working in Prague with Radio Free Europe, working in Bosnia, um, on security in the U, uh, with the UN, working in Kosovo with the UN, 2003 to 2006, being the chief emergency communications officer for the UN's UNICEF out of New York. That's the kind of experience and background that Gordon brought um, to writing this book, but the book really is informed by the period 2007 to 2009, when Gordon was in Sri Lanka as the political communications advisor and spokesman for the United Nations. So it comes deeply informed of what is happening on the ground. This isn't a text of some academic sitting in some ivory tower, but someone who's there. Gordon is now back with us in Australia, based at University of Sydney Department of Political Science, but I think he's got a little bit of work running around the country, getting more people to buy and read his book. And so we are wonderfully blessed to be on that stop on that uh, train stop, and we thank him for coming, and we look forward to welcome him, welcoming him back in the future. With that, let me turn over to Gordon Weiss to speak about the book, The Cage. Gordon. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Professor Anderson, for the introduction, and thank you to Bina de Costa for your efforts to organize this evening. Uh, I often speak off, off the cuff, but considering the, uh, the venue, I actually took the trouble to write something down tonight, so bear with me while I stumble through it. Um, I come to you as a, as a somewhat reluctant commentator on Sri Lankan affairs. I was a career UN official uh, for a dozen years, three of which I served in Sri Lanka. Uh, having spent three years there, the last thing I expected to do was to spend a year writing about it all. Uh, but I did, and, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking it, about it tonight with you. Uh, I did write about it because I believed that um, I, I could produce a reasonably objective view of the conflict, which provided an alternative narrative to that established by the government of Sri Lanka. Uh, that account, supported with all the resources that lie with any government, made no mention of the lethal impact on civilians, or at least the government's role in the lethal impact on civilians. And if you doubt the readiness of the government of Sri Lanka to spend huge resources to support a neat but uh, patchy account of what happened during the final phase of the war, I suggest that you watch YouTube. I'm told that they've just released a new documentary in which I am partly featured. I've not seen it, but I suspect that it will include a fair measure of blow, bluster and bullying without any meaningful effort to come to terms with the questions that I will suggest are still left unanswered. I note also that the 161-page report just released by the government, which is reported to acknowledge for the first time that there were civilian deaths, still leaves much more left unsaid than it actually answers. Uh, I would say that it's a predictable effort to delay meaningful accountability over the final phase of the war in Sri Lanka. My book, my little book, is by no means the end of the story. As the Australian Spectator noted, it doesn't provide prescriptions, but it does ask a lot of questions. The end of the story will be, one hopes, uh, 
reconciliation between the antagonistic communities of Sri Lanka, followed by peace and prosperity for all of Sri Lanka's people. And, uh, and I don't say that lightly or tritely. But I want to address some of the questions left hanging over the kind of peace now unfolding in Sri Lanka. And to look at some of those big issues hovering so uneasily in the air. Peace, justice and reconciliation, big ideas. And to look at those ideas in the context of allegations of crimes committed by both sides in the course of this final phase of the war. Now, crimes were allegedly committed by both sides throughout this entire war. Today, however, I will confine my remarks to just the final phase of the war. I won't address a range of issues I do examine in my book. And forgive me if I refer to my book a number of times, but the fact is that I know what I know because I've written this book. Um, uh, for example, such things I address in the book as the long history of overwhelming violence used by the state when dealing with critical challenges to the authority of the state. And I'm referring, of course, to those of you who are somewhat familiar with Sri Lanka's history, uh, to the two uprisings by the Sinhalese JVP in 1971 and the, late, and the late 1980s. I actually go into that in quite some detail in my book. In my book, I argue that there is something of a continuum which made the extreme solution that I argue we saw unfold in 2009 perhaps predictable in some sense. I'll also suggest that proper consideration of the final phase of the war cannot be entrusted, should not be entrusted, to the government of Sri Lanka, for reasons I'll outline, but more properly belongs in the realm of an international judicial investigation. Further, although what's good for Sri Lanka and her people must certainly feature and is paramount, I will suggest that this is not the only factor of importance in this debate. Uh, I want to give you, I see that we have fortunately a, a relatively mixed audience tonight, so I want to give you a brief potted history of, uh, or at least my version of history of Sri Lanka, that revolves around two critical dates, 1956 and 1983, and for any Sri Lankan in, in the room that will immediately ring alarm bells. Uh, before we move on to the third critical date, which is uh, 2009, nobody seriously questions the basic facts or impact of these two moments in Sri Lanka's post-independence history. The first years after independence from Britain in 1948 were relatively peaceful, even though even then there were the makings of the future troubles that would emerge in post-independence Sri Lanka. Britain had conferred on the island a liberal parliamentary democracy, which as we know is the best of all possible systems, of course. In keeping, however, with many countries in the decolonization period, there were darker forces at play. Uh, and I want you to remember or remind you, if I can, of the generally tumultuous times in 1948 uh, throughout the world. The terrible bloodshed in which so many countries were born. India had just experienced its traumatic petition in 1947 with perhaps a million dead. Israel was founded even as five Arab armies attempted to conquer the foundling state. And in 1948, an unrecognisable Europe had only just completed one of the biggest population transfers or ethnic cleansings, as it would come to be known, in history. I'm referring to the roughly three million ethnic Germans expelled from European countries in which they had lived for hundreds of years, who were forcibly sent to live in a foreign land, Germany. By contrast, in 1948, Sri Lanka, or Ceylon as it was then known, gained independence in relative tranquility and with great promise. But that promise masked another reality. The liberal democracy conferred somewhat carelessly by Britain upon Ceylon had an effect that had been foreseen some 10 years earlier by British analysts, and in fact it was the subject of the chattering classes. 
Uh, I'm talking about the Donnemore Commission that in fact made recommendations about the way in which Sri Lankan independence should be brought about. One of the specific things they said was they, they had their doubts about whether a liberal parliamentary democracy would work in Sri Lanka. The Buddhist Sinhalese, who accounted for two-thirds of the population of some 12 million, after 1948 held effective power. The Tamils, by contrast, who had played an important role under the British, were suddenly left relatively powerless, consigned to second-tier importance, and at least it was a second-tier importance that they felt. It was the source of a part of this grievance. But of course, that's what democracy entails, of course, electoral rule by a majority. However, there was an initial irresolvable tension, despite the presence of functioning political parties that reflected some of the great ideologies of the first half of the 20th century. Nevertheless, despite these tensions, the benign prime ministerships of D.S. Senanayake and his son Dudley kept the body politic humming along. It was a sort of gentleman's political club, and politics worked by mutual agreement. In 1956, however, the mask of civility fell away, or rather it was torn off. The year before, in 1955, SWRD Bandranayaka, the great Sinhalese counterweight to the dominating Senanayaka family, made a single rash electoral promise. He said that if elected to power, he would introduce an act that would in effect give preeminence to the Sinhalese language over both Tamil and English. As SWRD's daughter, Chandrika Kumaratunga, a, for, a, former, prime, a former president of Sri Lanka remarked just two weeks ago, her father made a dreadful mistake. Lee Kuan Yew, the great statesman of Singapore, has made much the same remark in relation to Sri Lanka, that this was a terrible error. It introduced a, an irreversible element into Sri Lankan politics. When Bandaranaike was surely elected Prime Minister, the Sinhala Only Act, as it came to be known, had a devastating effect. As former President Kamaratunga says, this law caused ethnic riots and contributed to the war that has just concluded by excluding minorities. Between 1956 and 1983, there are many other dates to note. But let's just say that the trajectory of state-imposed discrimination continued to disadvantage minorities. Nobody today seriously questions the divisive impact of 1956, and a vast majority of Sri Lankans from all communities would, I dare say, do things very differently today. After 1956, tens of thousands of Tamils emigrated from Sri Lanka but not just Tamils. The mixed blood burghers deserted the island in droves and large numbers of educated Sinhalese as well, and many of them came here to Australia. Leaving, after all, is one response to policies of discrimination. And many people from all communities didn't like the trajectory that their own country was taking. But another response in the face of indifference or well, simply because one cannot leave, because one is poor, is armed struggle. Which brings me to the next date, 1983, a fulcrum moment. In that year, riots broke out across the island. The trigger was the killing of 13 soldiers by a ragtag outfit known as the LTTE, or we know them as the Tamil Tigers. There had been many episodes of intercommunal violence since the late 19th century. Following independence, there had been significant riots in 1956, 1958, 1977, in which hundreds of people, predominantly Tamils, had been killed. But 1983 was altogether more serious. It's estimated that somewhere between one and 3,000 people were killed in the course of a few days in an episode known as Black July. The overwhelming majority of them were Tamils, murdered by gangs of Sinhalese. 
It should also be noted, however, and you will always hear this from Tamils who escape the violence, that countless thousands of Tamils owe their lives to Sinhalese families who sheltered them. But Black July was a kind of crystal nut for the Tamils of Sri Lanka, a scar on their collective psyche. The immediate effect of the riots was threefold. Firstly, thousands of Tamil youths flocked to enlist in the LTT and other radical revolutionary groups, transforming these ragtag uh, bandit outfits into very large revolutionary groups. Prior to 1983, these groups had been relatively insignificant, a nuisance rather than a threat to the state. The LTT, for example, had consisted of a few dozen men at most, with a handful of murders and some bank robberies to their credit. And, and, and a lot of those murders, by the way, were of Tamils, not Sinhalese. They were often Tamil members of the security forces. Secondly, India, for a complex of reasons, the second effect of the, of the uh, 1983 riots was that India, for a complex of reasons, opened training bases on her soil to thousands of Tamil fighters who were trained and then sent back to sow mischief in Sri Lanka. Finally, the 1983 riots converted, and I think this is the most important uh, aspect of the 1983 riots, it converted hundreds of thousands of ordinary, peaceful, law-abiding Tamils in Sri Lanka and abroad. They became convinced that the only thing standing between the Tamils of Sri Lanka and their physical annihilation by the state was the gun. It's not an uncommon, an, an uncommon story, in fact. You can transpose the same conditions, the same set of conditions to many other countries, I think. If you want to learn about the conversion of ordinary people to a violent reaction, I suggest you read about the conversion to armed resistance of a 17-year-old Catholic middle-class Tamil girl, Naomi de Zoysa, who recently released her book Tamil and Tigris, points to the burning of the Jaffna Library in 1981 as her personal conversion. But the point is the same. Nobody in Sri Lanka seriously questions the fatal impact of 1983 or the direct link between these riots and the declaration of a defensive war by Sri Lankan Tamils. This insurgency eventually became a serious threat to the state. Thus, we have to give some measure of credence to the fact that the armed rising against the state was a reasonable response. It was arguably a just response, given the failure of the state to provide security to its citizens. We've seen the same instances in recent times. I was certainly in Kosovo, both, both before and after their re revolution there. And there are many similarities. And one can point to, I think, a, a range of uh, similar circumstances around the world. So just cause, such as the right of people to rise against tyranny, remains a recognized fundamental political right. It's given birth to so many countries, uh, members of the UN. It's currently driving the Arab Spring, which is demonstrably a popular response to tyranny. The Tamil response to 1983 was an equal, equally popular uprising. Of course, there were many Tamils who dissented from this course, moderates who would later be targeted by the LTT, incidentally. But generally, it was supported across a wide spectrum of the Tamil community. The fault line at independence, which became a grievance in 1956 with the Sinhala Only Act, suddenly became a violent backlash in 1983. But what happened to this just cause and its associated response? I believe, and I've written as much in my book, that with the dominance of the Tamil Tigers, the just cause was doomed at its inception by the unjust means selected by the Tamil Tigers. Further, I believe that much of the responsibility for this failure lies with the personal rule 
of the Tiger Supremo, Velupilai Prabhakaran. And I know that that will be an unpopular comment with many of you in this room. You may think quite reasonably that I am disliked by the government of Sri Lanka. But if you haven't read my book, you won't be aware of how unpopular I am with those who still burn a candle for this man, of whom there are many. I won't delve too deeply here into my argument that this just cause was supplanted and ultimately perverted by Prabhakaran. I will refer you to chapter four of my book, but I go into it in some detail there. Suffice to say, he was a man for his times, with a penchant for violence, who found his calling in the Tamil cause. The American political philosopher Michael Walzer says, and I quote, the revolutionary reveals his freedom in the same way that he earns it, by directly confronting his enemies and refraining from attacks on anybody else. The LTT developed into an ingenious fighting force that made use of multiple forms of warfare, from classic guerrilla to conventional units supported by artillery. In the 1990s, they became an archetype for the non-state threat to the state in the new world order that followed the end of the Cold War. But their use of terrorist tactics, which was one set of tactics in their armory of tactics, took a mounting toll on civilian lives. And in my book, I, I go to some trouble to distinguish between uh, the use of terrorism and other tactics used by the LTT. Uh, Innocent people, commuters, villagers, not just Sinhalese, but Tamils too, fell victim to this targeted violence. Terror was a conscious, tactical choice. It was one that the ANC in South Africa determinedly avoided because Mandela believed that terror attacks on civilians would destroy the struggle for justice. This is precisely, I believe, what ultimately happened to the LTTE. To paraphrase Walzer, the kind of freedom revealed by the LTT was not a very palatable one. The struggle for justice, poisoned by excessive violence, ultimately obscured the just cause of the Tamil people. And here's the twist, and this is really important, this twist, at some indeterminate point in this quarter, long, in this quarter century long war, between 1983 and 2009, at some point, the right of the state to reclaim its territory and to reimpose rule over its citizens became the just cause. Now it's for others to determine at what point that occurred. As I say in my book, I went to Sri Lanka as a supporter of the state's right to reclaim its territory. And I left with that belief intact, given the circumstances I've outlined above. But, and here is a big but, to paraphrase Walter again, if the revolution reveals itself in the way it is fought, surely the reverse must be true, that the state reveals itself in the way that it is defended. So for me, Whilst defending the right of the state to reclaim its territory from this insurgent group, there, there were questions, serious questions, left hanging at the end of the war. Surely the cause was just, but were the methods used by the state just? And beyond the victory, did the state reveal itself as a just victor? In 2006, the government of Sri Lanka, under the leadership of Pre President Mahinda Rajapaksa, began an, unparall an unparalleled effort to destroy the Tamil Tigers. Mahinda Rajapaksa was and remains a popularly elected leader. Together with his brothers Gotabaya and Basil, they doggedly sought a military solution to the Tamil Tiger menace. The advantage of the brothers Rajapaksa was their unity of purpose and their combined competence and political savvy. 
They recruited massive numbers of troops whilst they established predictable lines of credit for cash, oil and arms supplies from friendly countries such as China, Pakistan and our favourite Iran. India and the US chipped in with intelligence and radar that enabled the interception and sinking by the Sri Lankan Navy of Tiger Arms supply vessels on the high seas. Incredible engagements fought actually not far from the Australian coast on one occasion. Meanwhile, over the course of about two years, the armed forces of Sri Lanka steadily rolled back the Tamil Tiger lines, first north and then eastwards across the island. The basic strategy of the army was one of attrition. Whilst they held the existing front lines, small units of commandos wrought havoc deep inside Tiger territory. I argue in my book that between 2007 and 2009, the armed forces of Sri Lanka fought to a disciplined battle plan that involved relatively low civilian casualties. Villagers fled their homes as army bombardments came close. Artillery pounded the Tiger lines, drawing more and more fighters in before troops moved steadily forward to claim territory. Gradually, by late 2008, hundreds of thousands of civilians had been uprooted and were on the move. And perhaps this is when what was happening in Sri Lanka uh, pierced the consciousness of a number of people here, when, when, the, uh, when the, uh, the, the full impact of this war was becoming known. But of those people who were uprooted, only a few thousand managed to cross the front lines into government territory. Most civilians making individual survival decisions for their families. And there were probably around 50,000 of these families inside, retreated further into Tamil Tiger held territory. Military observers who always said that the Tigers were unbeatable, and they continued to say that until very late in the day. People who had observed this war in Sri Lanka for many, many years said the Tigers were militarily unbeatable. They were convinced that Prabhakaran was engaged in a Fabian retreat they waited for the master counterstroke, but it never came. More and more civilians were gathered up in the retreat, either unable or unwilling or forcibly prevented from crossing the front lines into government held territory by the Tigers. So here we come to the issue of just war and just means, which is really why I wrote my book, The Cage. As more and more civilians were forced into a smaller and smaller pocket of land, those who led the Sri Lankan army were faced with a dilemma, a serious dilemma, a real dilemma for military planners. How to separate and finish off the Tamil Tigers, to kill Prabhakaran in the same way that Osama bin Laden was notably killed and deliberately killed by the US, and to spare as many civilians as possible. This is a singularly modern problem, not because these kinds of battles haven't been fought before. Military history from Thucydides onwards is one long bloody tale of civilians being butchered by armies intent on coming to terms with each other. But the difference is today we have complex laws of war that govern, in theory, how armies fight. The notion is that it is unjust to kill non-combatants if it can be avoided. The government of Sri Lanka had nothing per se to gain from killing civilians and everything to gain from pulling off an historic victory over an implacable enemy with as little bloodshed as possible. And incidentally, I believe that that intent guided their battle plan pretty much throughout. During this period, and I'm talking about late January 2009 when things apparently began to come unstuck, through to mid-May when the battle was brought to an end, the government continued to maintain the following propositions. Their forces were not responsible for civilian deaths. They had what they called a zero civilian casualty policy. If there were any civilian deaths, it was the Tigers 
shooting their own. Which, by the way, had enough truth in it to make it a, 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 a presentable fact. Because there is evidence, plenty of it, to show that the Tigers killed civilians to prevent them from leaving the siege area. To this day, the government continues to insist that its forces were not responsible for any civilian deaths. Then they repeated another mantra. The government persistently asserted that they were not using heavy artillery. The use of heavy artillery in an area in which civilians rubbed shoulders with fighters was a necessarily indiscriminate device. Discrimination when targeting an adversary is one of the building blocks of the laws of war, one of the cardinal rules. The government knew this, which is why they gave repeated assurances to people such as UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. We're not using heavy weapons, they said. Finally, from January, they insisted that there were barely any civilians inside. Initially, they conceded 50,000. Then they said 70,000, but never above that number as people continued to flock out. In the event when the battle was done in mid-May, around 300,000 people emerged from the siege zone. To this day, those three elements have never been satisfactorily explained. No civilian deaths, no use of artillery, and very few people inside. That assertion that very few people were inside. So there was this absurd insistence that the government of Sri Lanka forces were not responsible for a single civilian casualty, nor were they responsible for any wrongdoing in this ferociously fought battle in which around 6,000 Sinhalese soldiers were killed. A huge toll. This incidentally explains the rather dogged and some would say unbalanced reporting from Channel 4 UK, which has continued to deconstruct this self-evident absurdity, beginning with serious allegations around battlefield executions. Reporters, after all, are pretty good at sniffing out when something is rotten. Incidentally, which army can say rationally that it is free of wrongdoing on the battlefield? Australia has had a recent incident in which we have examined the, uh, the uh, carriage of our troops on the battlefield in Afghanistan. By extension, why the continual insistence by the government that it didn't use heavy weapons? As you may know, a UN report issued in April says that there is credible evidence to suggest that hospitals and medical points were deliberately and systematically targeted using heavy weapons by the army of Sri Lanka. That report speaks about 65 separate instant, instant instances documented of hospitals and medical points that at the time were filled with civilians. And why the odd arithmetic related to the numbers? Why the insistence that so few civilians were trapped inside the siege zone when the government's own civil service knew the figures? The army had state-of-the-art, eye-in-the-sky, real-time intelligence delivered to it by drone and by the satellite technology of its allies, Chi the Chinese and the Indians. They also, as they have frequently repeated, had excellent ground intelligence. It's what contributed to the considerable victory that they eventually won. So I'm often asked, but how do you know how many people were killed? Well, one reply is that I don't know. That's one reply. I won't give you the other replies, but that's one reply. But we do know that we should take with a grain of salt anything the government of Sri Lanka has to say on the matter of civilian deaths. This, after all, is a government that insists to this day that its forces killed no civilians. And I'm aware of the report that's just been issued as well. And what we do know, to be Rumsfeldian about it for a moment, is what we don't know. All those questions left unanswered by the things that the government of Sri Lanka tried to sell us the truth and which turned out to be so patently false. We do have pretty good indications that probably somewhere between 10 and 40,000 people were killed. This is not my own figure plucked from nowhere. It's credible enough for the UN 
to have used it as part of its assessment into the available evidence. Now, the reason why all this matters is because it goes, again, to the heart of why I wrote my book. Describing a uh, counter-narrative to that rather absurd a narrative that was presented and has been stuck by, uh, by the government of Sri Lanka. I do suggest in my book that having fought the good fight and a fairly disciplined campaign over a number of years, the government tripped up at the last hurdle. It took a course of action that has resulted in alleged grave crimes. The reasons for this are complex. I won't go into them now, and we don't know all the answers as to why this happened. But I believe that there is enough evidence of wrongdoing out there and enough blanket denial, obfuscation and sheer bluster from the government to warrant an international judicial investigation into the final phase of the war in Sri Lanka. Incidentally, we know one part of the story because the government has never been shy to present the evidence. We know that the Tigers were responsible for mass, mass executions, for forcible recruitment, and for keeping their own people hostage against a full frontal assault by the government. Recall that there were no independent journalists and no real presence of international humanitarian workers inside or close to the siege zone. The exceptions to that were two international UN officers whose stories are detailed in my book, and the International Red Cross, which maintained an, evac an evacuation point on the beach uh, in the northeast, uh, where, where, where people were finally confined in the final phase of the siege. Yet somehow, despite the paucity of independent reports, the lack of outspoken witnesses, most of us, most of you, were left with an impression of how this three decades old insurgency ended. It was probably something along the lines of something happened, probably a lot of civilians died. We don't really know and probably never will. On balance, it's a good thing that the Tamil Tigers were destroyed. Perhaps, given the vagueness of it all, we even decided that it's best left where it is. Let sleeping dogs lie. Indeed, since the end of the war, we have heard the government of Sri Lanka and its proxies advance various reasons for letting the dogs of war lie. It's nobody's business but Sri Lanka's. It's all smoke and mirrors, the trickery of the Tamil diaspora. It's an international conspiracy Although, like a bad detective novel, the purported motives remain rather hazy. It's a human rights cabal led by self-righteous, do-gooding, drum-beating campaigners like Vice. Look at the US and Iraq, or Australia's treatment of its native people, or the British bombing of Dresden. Why pick on us? Or, but we were fighting terrorists like you guys. Or, we in Sri Lanka don't do the Judeo-Christian reconciliation thing. Sorry. Or, well, we do do the reconciliation thing, frankly, and all these accusations are spoiling our efforts at, at reconciliation, which is, I, th I think, what you heard a couple of weeks ago for anyone who was here at the lecture a couple of weeks ago. Incidentally, I don't know if any of you have read the International Crisis Group's latest report, Reconciliation in Sri Lanka Harder Than Ever? Question mark. The title says it all. Incidentally, one of the things it says is that the Tamil diaspora have failed to take on board the failings of the Tamil Tigers as well. But the credible allegations of gross wrongdoing, of law breaking in fact, are there and they are real and they have continued to emerge in the two years or so since the end of the war. The problem is now that it's the government of Sri Lanka that's left to carry the burden of those accusations because the senior Tamil Tiger leadership were all killed. There's no one left to put on trial. The government says that to scrutinise them is unfair and that the gains to be made from looking at what happened at the end of the war are outweighed by the benefits of peace. Who can argue with that? Don't mess with our version of events, they say, because you're messing with reconciliation. In other words, there's an implied threat that the nosy parkers are going to spoil the peace. So does it matter? Does the truth matter? I happen to think that the truth always matters. Not in a rancorous, unbending, black and white, legalese sense, but only that truth matters in and of itself. But that's not good enough. 
because of course there are greater issues at play. What's the point of truth if you can't have peace? This brings me to the timing of truth, which is important as we consider the requirements of justice versus the requirements of peace. First to justice. In the 1860s, during the American Civil War, it was considered acceptable to take and exe execute civilian hostages. It was an acceptable tactic of war. In the siege of Leningrad during World War II, it was theoretically legal for the German army to force starving civilians back into Leningrad, where a million of them died of starvation. Teddy Roosevelt was considered liberal because he had misgivings about black Americans being lynched. At one stage, we in Australia thought it OK to deny the franchise to the original inhabitants of our country. My point is that while we as people probably don't evolve much at our essence, at our core, our means of restraining ourselves have evolved. Our notions of what constitutes justice and just means evolves. The course of international justice since the Second World War traces this very arc. However, one characteristic of justice is that as it evolves, so too the fiction that justice is not temporal but is eternal. And one can understand the resentment that that breeds. That something considered legal one year is illegal the next. But let's not kid ourselves, let's not be blinded. By today's standards, the wholesale killing of civilians in pursuit of a military objective is quite simply illegal. It is, however, for a court to decide the various thresholds, proportionality, distinction, the relative value of the military gains, and not for us this evening in relation to the war in Sri Lanka. And now to touch on peace. I don't know if I can do this, but who here believes that one can have a peaceful future without an acknowledgement of the past? It's a pressing question. A peaceful future without an acknowledgement of the past. I do, for one. Last century, Japan and Germany were surely forced by defeat to confront their monumental crimes. They rebuilt their societies, beginning with war crimes trials that confronted the truth. But we can't ignore the empirical evidence of a country like Spain, so liberal, so evolved, so central to the European ideal, yet which has largely avoided any reconciliation with the truth of its murderous civil war 75 years ago. It built a society based on forgetting. I was living in Spain at the time when they began digging up bodies in fields from the civil war. It was fascinating. These old people who had walked past these bodies all their lives and finally it was okay to dig them up and acknowledge their relatives they'd never been able to acknowledge before. But Spain built a society based on forgetting. So as uncomfortable as I feel about saying this, and although my spirit rebels against it, I must say that I think it is possible for justice to be ignored in pursuit of a lasting peace. If justice is not necessarily a precondition for lasting peace, then surely reconciliation is. I'm not so sure. I want to read you my prognosis for Sri Lanka, if I may. Uh, and I'm very close to being finished, I promise you. Um, unfortunately, judging by current trends on the ground, an astute soothsayer might guess that the future for Sri Lanka's Tamil citizens is bleak. The emigration of Tamils from Sri Lanka will continue encouraged by political stagnation, a lack of rights, and ruled by fear. Tens of thousands of t Tamils displaced by the fighting but unable to leave will be resettled at the government's discretion, using security as a pretext for usurping private property in key areas. The hitherto relatively contiguous area that has formed the basis for a Tamil claim to an historic homeland will be broken up and interspersed with hundreds of army camps staffed by Sinhalese soldiers. Incidentally, for those of you who have read my book, I also take on that, uh, that notion of the historic uh, Tamil homeland. Um, but nevertheless, that is my prognosis uh, for the future. Um, the point is 
that if I were in the position of the government of Sri Lanka, I might solve my ethnic problem the very same way. Europe did it for hundreds of years, even up until 1947, the founding year, almost, of Sri Lanka. I'd like to restate what I established from the outset in my book. I went to Sri Lanka as a supporter of that state's right to reclaim its sovereign territory from an insurgent group whose just cause had been hopelessly perverted by the methods it chose to use. The Tamil Tigers targeted civilians, ran secret prisons and torture centres and were ruthless towards even their own people. Even at the very end, when all was hopeless, their policy appears to have been one of scant mercy. The world is a better place without Velupillai Prabhakaran. But is there peace? What kind of peace is it? Will it last? Is it the type of peace that we would wish on other countries that face similar internal challenges? There is certainly no justice coming from the government of Sri Lanka and no real effort to provide a credible, meaningful account of how they managed this final phase of the war. And don't be fooled by talk of reconciliation. It's a fine word. It slips easily from the tongue with those plummy English accents that you'll hear on this documentary that's just been uh, released. But I suggest to you that reconciliation is meaningless without the truth. Reconciliation a la the, government, the current government of Sri Lanka is a prescription to ensure that like 1956 and 1983, the year 2009 will remain just another bloody marker in Sri Lanka's history of suppression, of violent suppression of political dissent. Not just over the Tamils, but all political dissent. Look to what happens this November when the government's own Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission hands down its findings. My final point is just this. The UN panel says that what appears to have happened in Sri Lanka represents a grave assault on the entire regime of international law. Yet despite all the practical doubts I have outlined, I remain a realist, fatally drawn to the allure of liberal internationalism. I think that Australia should support a credible inquiry into what happened in Sri Lanka. Because we as a society uphold and believe in the rule of law. And no Sri Lankan who comes and lives in Australia, as my friend Naomi de Zoysa has said to me, can miss that distinction. The protection of the rule of law. And also because the rule of law has become increasingly important in the international power structure. In an increasingly insecure world, soft power mechanisms emanating from the rule of law matter. The way that countries choose to handle their internal affairs do affect us. The few Tamil refugees washing up on our shores are a tiny example. Think of the 300,000 Bosnian refugees who flowed into Germany during the wars in the former Yugoslavia. I wrote, I wrote my book alone for a year without any research assistance or any financial support for the very simple reason that I think that what happened in Sri Lanka matters. Pursuing justice in Sri Lanka, seeing justice done, leaving aside the interests of Sri Lanka's people is in, is in Australia's own best long-term interests. As Greg Sheridan wrote just weeks ago in The Australian regarding our China relationship, Australia should never be afraid of speaking truth to power. Thanks for your patience. Why should there be international investigation into Sri Lanka if no one has any idea how many civilian deaths were? And if the deaths were around 2,000, why would there be international investigation? The number 2,000 comes from this. ICRC transported 4,500 injured civilians and 9,000 bystanders. Yeah. From the Tamil uh, entity area into single area. So that was the total number of civilians injured at the time. Uh, according to whom? ICRC International Red Cross. Well, no, according to the government's version of, 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 uh, of, of the ICRC uh, figures. Well, that, that, that ICRC hasn't said anything, anything other than that. That's the because they won't. The ICRC doesn't say anything. That's how they gain their privileged access to battlefields. Yeah, ICRC released the figure because government provided ships for them to transport the wounded. Yeah. And they, they transported 4,500 injured and plus another 9,000 bystanders. If there were more injured during medical attention, there was no way they would have transported 
injured. Yeah. Okay, look, it's a good question. Why should there be an international investigation? But I think that's what I was saying here tonight. I think there should be an international, uh, an international investigation because there has not been yet a credible explanation for so many things that happened at the end of the war. If there's, if there's no prima facie case for a war crime, why would there be an investigation? But the UN advisory panel... No, 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 please don't, 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 don't now question. I understand that it's one of the tactics of the government of Sri Lanka to call it the Durrisman Report. Yes, that is. And, and, and to not, not actually assign it um, the status of an official... No, that's the opinion of the government of Sri Lanka. No, that is No, 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 no. Um, yes, yes, well, Ban Ki-moon's the Secretary General of the United Nations. It does give it a certain status, don't you agree? Of course, yeah. and those three people gave their personal opinion to Ban No, it's not just a personal opinion, it's an advisory report. Yes. Given by, given by three senior international jurists to the UN Secretary General. Well, okay, fine, all right. So, but, 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 no, 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 look, I, and, and, I, and I applaud your courage, and I also applaud the courage of this gentleman, even though he didn't actually give me a question, he wanted to give a speech, but I applaud your courage in getting up and, and, and challenging the stuff that I say. But I, but I, but I still, I, I, I would still say to you that you haven't really listened to what I've said in the last 50 minutes, and I apologise to people who've sat through 50 minutes of me talking. So another question? Yes, the gentleman at the back. Yes, yes. sir. Thank you, Gordon, for your yeah. speech. Uh, my question actually is that you mentioned that uh, from 2006 to about end of 2008, the Sri Lankan army fought a reasonably uh, uh, disciplined, disciplined war. Yes. So my question is, so what went wrong in the last phase of the war? Well, uh, as I said, I think it's complex. Um, and I think that it's not really known in one sense, but I think that the army began trying to meet deadlines. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, one indication is the large numbers of troops that began getting killed in the final phase of the war. There were some really desperate, uh, hard fought battles. Um, and I think there were some significant dates that were laid down that were according to a political timetable rather than a military timetable. Um, one of the things that I uh, I, I, I describe in my book, certainly as the role of the, of the Indian elections, um, which I think were from May uh, 13th to May 16th, 2009. So I, 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 I think that the battle itself, there became an urgency to finish the war, and I think that the pressure was growing from the international community as well to try and prevent the bloodshed, uh, to, to prevent the impact on civilians at the end of the war. So the the uh, uh, consequent um, um, pressure on the government grew and the uh, impulse grew to finish the war very quickly. I, I think it was concluded in a very um, hurried way and in a way that, was, uh, that it hadn't been fought perhaps in the previous two years. As I said, I mean, I, my impression is that they tripped up at the, at the last hurdle. Does that, does that explain it to some extent? It's not refined perhaps, but yes. Mm. Um, what is your view in terms of the practical difficulties for the international community to really engage with this, you know, 27 right. year long conflict, particularly from the perspective of the doctrine of um, responsibility to protect? Um, I'm talking about now uh, we're going through the phase of reconciliation, but given the doctrine coming to in existence early 2000 or 2003, I believe. I suppose there was a period of time, I suppose there could be some action going on, say, not, not for them, um, possibly to react. So what is your view about the difficulties for the international community to really effectively prevent further humanitarian um, crisis? Yeah, well, I think it's a complicated um, 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 paradigm. I mean, the, uh, you know, it's one of the things I actually talk about quite extensively in my book is that you know, the reason why Sri Lanka was able to, and, and it was really one of those moments, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a moment that they, that they um, uh, seized upon um, quite reasonably, uh, 
uh, and that was, uh, you know, the, the advent of China, um, of a wealthy China in the international scene, um, of a somewhat weakened um, US and America, in, uh, sorry, US and India in Sri Lanka. Um, so they really had, the, the gate was open and Sri Lanka was able to take advantage of investment in Sri Lanka, um, reasonable, reasonable um, um, arms, uh, cash and uh, oil credit supply lines, and so there was not a lot to restrain them um, uh, on the international scene. With the protection of China, there really was not a lot to restrain Sri Lanka. And, and ultimately, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is a sovereign country. It, it, it operates and makes decisions according to its own best interests. Um, its interests were protected, protected in the Security Council by pr principally China, also Russia, also to a lesser extent India. Um, it was what I call a, a, a geopolitical moment um, uh, in the book. Um, regarding the, the, the doctrine of responsibility to protect, I mean, that was a developing doctrine and, 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 and really it's a, it's a doctrine that has yet to be adopted by the international community across the board and it remains, a, it remains a, a, uh, an untested doctrine, really. I seem to recall um, that uh, Professor Gareth Evans during the war said that Sri Lanka was in fact, in his opinion, and he was one of the people who worked on the doctrine to protect for the uh, Secretary General at the time, Kofi Annan, said that Sri Lanka was not a case for uh, um, 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 R2P. Um, but um, uh, uh, from, the, from the point of view of the UN and the UN's involvement, because that was another protective factor in Sri Lanka, I mean, the UN had been kept very weak in Sri Lanka. It didn't have a political role. It, didn't have, it certainly didn't have a military role. Um, it was not party to... Uh, peace talks between the parties, it really only had a humanitarian role. So it had a very weak role in, in, uh, in Sri Lanka. So there were, there were very few forces to really restrain the government of Sri Lanka. It was one of those sort of perfect, perfect moments, really, and the government quite reasonably took advantage of that perfect moment to try and finish off the war. They had domestic su political support. They had great credit from um, China and protection from China. Um, it, the, there was the transition between the uh, Bush and Obama administrations, uh, you know, uh, so there was not a lot to restrain, there was not a lot to restrain Sri Lanka and they, they, they took care of business as they saw fit. I hope that's goes somewhere towards answering that's your question. Yes. I have to ask this question. Yes. How did you or other people come to the conclusion that during the final stage of this war, 40,000 civilians died? Okay. You or uh, how did people... Is it by counting the bodies or going through lists? Or how did they come to the No, it's not it's absolutely not by counting the bodies. And two and a half I mean, two and a half years later, the I mean, battle I mean, the battlefield has never been visited by anyone apart from the army of Sri Lanka. So no my, let me finish if I may. So, so no one has has um, visited the, the, the battlefield. To all, to all intents and purposes, it is a closed dare I say, crime scene. No one knows, really. But I think there is enough evidence out there to triangulate what is missing and what is unanswered. So to say on one, to say on one hand, you don't know, you weren't there, you didn't count anyone, you didn't see anything, is not to say that there is not a problem. There is a problem. Yes, and we know, we, we, know, we, we, we know enough, we know enough to say, well, while the government of Sri Lanka was saying that nobody died and that its forces were not responsible for any deaths, yeah, and that they were not using heavy artillery, there's enough eyewitness testimony that we gathered to counter that. Yes, quantifying it in, the, in that range, 10,000 yeah. to 40,000. Well, let's say that, let, let, let's say that, let's say that, let's say that, yeah. That's a range, okay? That's right, that's right. <laughs> 10 to, 40, 10, 10 to 40,000. That's the issue in your book. Well, no, 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 no. I take issue with that. The issue is not numbers. The issue is an accountable, an accountable narrative. Uh, is true accountability. What happened at the end of the war? It's not coming from the government of Sri Lanka. If you guys stand here and say, yeah, 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 but you don't know how many people died. Was it 10 or 40? How did you come up with the figures, blah, blah, blah? We don't know. What people have asked for is accountability. And that has not come yet from the government of Sri Lanka. Certainly not from the 161-page report that was released two, two days ago. Certainly not from the 
um, very neat documentary that was put online yesterday, and it's probably not going to come, dare I say, from the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission. But I will say this, that there was a team of people who were triangulating the reports that they could get from inside the battle scene, and by early April, they had counted some 7,000 reports of people being killed. Some 7,000 by early April. Now, the greater part of the battle had yet to take place. The toughest fighting had yet to take place. That happened really between the beginning of April and mid-May. So who knows how many people died? We don't know. And it would be foolish for anyone to say that they know. But we do know what we don't know. And certainly what we don't have at the moment is a reasonable, a reasonable account from the government of Sri Lanka. We're still waiting for it. Tell us what happened. Yeah, in the absence of that, yeah. can we as responsible youth yeah. and we as responsible citizens come with this figure of 10 to 40,000? If, if we don't know what we don't know, yeah. right, how can we quantify this and try to put that as the main point? Well, if that's all we do know, yeah. if that's all we do know, and I'll tell you why the 40,000, because the, because the best population estimate or guesstimate ranges from 330,000 upwards. Now, I have said since January last year that I think between 10 and 40,000 people were killed. The lower figure based on the actual count, the upper figure based on what I choose to regard as the best population estimate, okay? Now, others, such as the International Crisis Group, have said, actually, we think it could be much higher. We think it might be 80,000. And let me tell you, in the Tamil diaspora, they're talking about 100,000, 200,000 dead. And you know why? Because they're not getting a reasonable account from anyone. Now, if the government of Sri Lanka said, we killed 5,000 civilians in the effort to finish off this dreadful terrorist group and kill Prabhakaran, it was terrible. We're, in, we're, a, we're a poor country. We, we didn't have a refined fighting force. We, we, we were under the gun, we thought we were going to lose him. But there's been nothing. There, there's been no reasonable account of what happened and the efforts that were undertaken. As I said, and as I said in the speech, I believe it was a just cause. But the method is, is, is really what needs accounting for. And, and it's not enough to say, yeah, yeah, we, we did it and no one got killed. Everyone happy? I, 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 don't, think that's, I don't think that's reasonable. Time for one more question. Sorry. Um, just more on the political side, now that the war is finished, um, you mentioned, yeah. um, I'm not familiar with all the names, um, I forget them previously, but you mentioned the, the president and his brothers. Yeah. Um, has the, of course, the victory strengthened them, and what's the, the road forward um, if, of course, they don't have um, these, uh, the required or what you suggest, the justice and reconciliation, what's the road forward for democracy and um, their own, the current president's um, strength and political power? I mean, it's a very good question. As I say, you know, um, the Rajapaksa, you know, Mahinda Rajapaksa is a popularly elected um, um, president. He has the support of the majority of Sri Lankans. Um, uh, the likelihood is that he will go on to, 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 to govern, you know, for many years to come. The likelihood is that prosperity will grow in Sri Lanka, there will be a form of peace, um, and, and things will improve. Things have improved immensely already. The security situation has improved. Plenty of Tamils say that. Plenty of Tamils say, well, you know, might have been worth it actually, you know, without really knowing what went on. Plenty of Tamils living in Sri Lanka say, yeah, you know, things are actually better. I don't have to go through checkpoints. I'm not being harassed by soldiers as much as, you know, you know, somewhere, somewhere in there, there is a threshold. There is a threshold somewhere in there. And, you know, international law is all, all about establishing that threshold. My essential argument is it's not good enough for a country just to say, well, nothing happened. Is everyone cool about that? We all right? Let's get on with the tourists flocking to the beaches now. I don't think that's OK. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't think that's a reasonable sort of response. I don't think that's a response of a, that's a reasonable response of a, of a, of a you know, of a, of, of a modern member of the international community, and I don't think that a country like Australia should accept that. I'd like to make a comment. 
1983, I was in the St. Lucia's camp, refugee camp, in the 1983 riots. Yeah. And the president of the country, they uh, was come and said in the television, I was in the camp, that more the single, the Tamil people are suffering, the simple people, single people be happier. Mm, yes, yes. Paper. Yeah. What I'm trying to say, that is the mindset of the people. Since the British left, Tamils are suffering for the last 60 years. That's the mindset of the single people, even today. Only exception is the uh, grandchildren of the uh, ex established um, yeah, Bandar Naika. Uh, yes. And I said that yeah. they are ashamed to be single. Mm. Unless the mindset change of the entire humanity, nothing will change. The humanity has to change that that uh, they had to respect each other. I have to tell you that coming and talking before an audience of uh, expatriates, you know, if you were Turks and Armenians, <laughs> I would have precisely the same problem. Because, um, you know, and I've seen it with my own father. My father is Jewish and, you know, came out of the Second World War. Uh, for me to stand up and try and make rational arguments and balance things up and talk about justice and those sorts of things, you know, it's all very fine and it sounds very reasonable and blah, blah. But people who have been through it feel it in a way that I can't possibly feel it and that I don't do justice to. And that applies to the Tamils and it applies to the Sinhalese. And everyone's got their own individual story about that. Um, you know, I, I've tried to capture the middle ground in my book and in the talk I've just given. Um, I suspect that I fail a lot of the time because I'm just seen as a, you know, the Sinhalese see me as a, as a member of an international conspiracy and a, you know, Bible thumping, you know, you know internationally, you know, rah-rah person. And the, and, the, and the Tamils see me as a, as a, as a um, well, you know, I've had people writing to me saying that I've written my book in the blood of Tamil children. So, and I wrote it for profit. Um, now, anyone who's written a book here, and I'm sure there are a number, knows that you don't write books for profit. You do not. Um, um, so, so, um, you know, I, I appreciate your expression of your, 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 ex, your expressions there and your personal experience. I, I can't reflect on them. All I, all I can try and reflect on is the middle ground I've, I've tried to capture. Anyway, yeah. Yes. You know, when you were talking all this about the number of deaths, yeah. Yeah. They were not there in Sri Lanka when the war took place. I was not there. Yes. But I happened to go there a couple of months back. Yeah. I read in one of the papers there, English paper, one of the priests, he has said, for the LLRC, he has given the evidence, he has said, more than 160,000 Tamils, no accounted. Can't be accounted for. Can't be accounted for. Right. No accounted. Yeah. Let me tell you, sir, I think 160,000 is absurd in my book. I think 100,000 is absurd. Excuse me, excuse, me for, excuse me for saying it. We don't know the number of people who were killed. We can only make a guess. I've made the best possible guess I can make, which is 10 to 40,000. Thanks very much for your patience, and excuse me if I've offended, offended people.